Bangak woman Jika Bangan on a Chandak. Welcome to my homeland. Barak Jajabarang Gundicha. Home of the Jajabarang people. This is the first time, to my knowledge, David Holmgren and Bruce Pascoe have shared a talk together, and I can't think of any two people I'd prefer to have in the room at the same time to inspire the juices for change, for political action, for reconciliation, for rethinking culture through economy and ways to perform life outside the banker's realm. I believe Aboriginal economies prior to their annihilation offer remarkable models for understanding future resilience and earth care as we move into an era of climate change and descending affluence, and are of course the seeds of inspiration for permaculture's inception back in the 1970s. But how much do we know about Aboriginal economies and the life ways that have been performed on this very ground going back tens of generations? I would like to um, begin by talking about how I came to write um, the book Dark Emu. Uh, I had written an essay for uh, a Canberra publishing company uh, which became a book and on the first page of my draft um, I said that Aboriginal people had been conducting agriculture in Australia. Uh, after I'd written a book called Convincing Ground about the contact wars in Australia, um, it became very apparent to me that Aboriginal people were doing a lot more than hunting and gathering. And so I included that in the draft of this book and I was told by a, a group of academics that it was impossible to include agriculture and Aborigine in the same sentence. Uh, I left that meeting and I bought as many cop second-hand copies of the Explorer's Diaries as I could find. And on page 89 of um, uh, Sir Thomas Mitchell's Journeys Through uh, Tropical Australia, um, I read uh, these lines, which I can virtually recite from memory. Um, Mitchell said that they were, uh, he and his fellow explorers, uh, were travelling through the Boulogne country on the New South Wales Queensland border and they rode through nine miles of stooped grain. I'd um, been taught history in primary school and secondary school. Um, I became a school teacher and I taught uh, English and history to students and I'd never heard or seen that text before. I came across a diary by Lieutenant Gray. He lost all his horses in, a, in an accident with whale boats on the, the shores of um, uh, Broome and uh, that's a, a story in itself. Take a couple of hours and probably a slab of beer to tell it properly. Um, but he then had to walk back to Perth because he'd lost everything. And he and his fellows uh, began that walk and they came across a field that had been cultivated so deeply they couldn't walk across it. Uh, he thought that was unusual. It's what, not what he'd come to Australia to expect because no one had mentioned it before. And uh, no one had warned him that he might expect this. He was walking through a country that no uh, European had walked through before, but even so he was shocked. The next day he came across another field exactly the same, uh, perhaps a little wider, 
uh, and he had to walk around it. He couldn't walk across it. It was so deeply cultivated. And the next day he came to another one. There were log houses uh, on the boundaries of these fields. There were wells dug periodically um, in order to irrigate the crop and there were paths all through it. And some of his fellows said they looked like the beaten paths of English villages. I was amazed by this uh, reference in our history, our available history, and amazed that I'd never been taught it by any of my school teachers, none of whom were mass murderers or um, deliberately uh, trying to hurt children, uh, except on occasions. Um, but this is part of Australian history and it wasn't being taught to us. I read Charles Sturt's uh, journal. Sturt was having terrible times in his attempt to find the inland sea. And he uh, was climbing these vertical sand dunes, one after another after another. And he and his fellows were virtually dying. They uh, had run out of water completely. If they didn't find water soon, they were going to die within 24 hours. Um, they got on one last sand dune, stood at the top, looked down, and they were hailed by 400 Aboriginal people. He was uh, shocked that there should be so many Aboriginal people in a land in which he was dying. How were these people surviving? What he found out was, when he got to the bottom of that hill, that those people uh, brought coolamons of water from their own well and held it out to him and his men and then turned to the horses, an animal they'd never seen before, and allowed the horses to drink, even with the horses' whiskers touching their fingers. Sturt commented in his journal about the bravery of those people, but then he had to comment on their generosity because they fed him and his men roast duck and cake. Sturt referred to those cakes as the lightest and sweetest he'd ever eaten. And you might expect people starving to death to uh, exaggerate a little, but <laughs> He, um, he was backed up by Sir Thomas Mitchell, who'd eaten the same sort of cake several times and he used exactly the same phrase, the sweetest and lightest. The people had been harvesting um, a crop they'd sown in the ephemeral riverbed of the Warburton River. They'd converted it into flour and they'd been living a bounteous life there um, with the wild fowl that was still on the ponds in the, the drying stream um, and converting uh, this grass into flour uh, so that they could live well in the, what is now called Sturt's Stony Desert, the dead heart of Australia. No Europeans live there today. No crops are grown there because it's impossible for Aboriginal people to grow that grain with buffalo and camels and cattle wandering across it. It was an incredible scheme, an incredible uh, devotion of labour and an incredible bit of science and agriculture and yet this country does, knows nothing about it. The, the thing that really shocks me is that 220 years of academic research in this country and no one can say what that grass was that those people were growing. Here is a very, very important source of flour for Australia. Grows on sand, needs only one watering, needs no fertiliser, needs no pesticide, produces the lightest and sweetest cakes in the world. We have 230 television shows about cooking in this country. <laughs> no one has ever referred to it. You know, this is an absence of scholarship.
the artifacts in this room are by majority from the Mount Franklin area. Mount Franklin was the home of um, the Aboriginal Protectorate, uh, which was set up in the 1840s. You may know about that story. Um, there's a bit of information and plans about that. Um, it, Mount Franklin was also a sacred place for the Jaja Wurrung. Uh, they would perform ceremonies and etc. up there. Um, I can't really tell you what the ceremonies were. It's up to the Jaja Wurrung to be telling you those stories. We've recently had the Jaja Wurrung Corporation do an assessment of all our artefacts. And an archaeologist looking at them. Um, and they've done an assessment. They will take that knowledge back to the Jaja Wurrung and bring that or offer that knowledge back to us at some stage. So that's a part of the respect process. So the information that are on there at the moment is what we had when Museum Victoria did an assessment um, many years ago. Sir so Thomas Mitchell, in his journals, um, as I said before, rode through nine miles of stooped grain, but he also rode through villages where every house was different and a thousand people lived there. He remarked uh, on the beauty of those houses, the grace of their design and the bounty of the food that was growing on their roofs and walls. The next day, after describing that first village that surprised him so much, because he'd also come to Australia uh, believing that Aboriginal people were hunters and gatherers and merely wandering around the face of the globe fairly helplessly, uh, the next day he found another village, another thousand people. The next day, another village, another thousand people. These people were close to the town of what is now Brewarrina, near the great fish traps. And those people were growing grain so that when the fishermen uh, came to make use of the fish traps, they could all be fed like a great harvest festival. Isaac Beatty came to Melbourne uh, to take up farming around the Melbourne district. He'd come out on a boat and he'd been told that there were virtually no Aboriginal people around and anyway, they didn't use the land which he found hard to understand because the hillsides of Melbourne had been terraced in the production of yam daisy. He was a farmer from England. He knew what water conservation was all about. He knew what soil conservation was all about and he knew what intensive agriculture looked like. He recognised these terraces for what they were and yet virtually no one else in the government of Victoria, as it became to be known, uh, mentions these things. There was a woman uh, around about 32,000 years ago near uh, Cuddy Springs. And um, she must have harvested some grain and looked at it. And she must have gone to bed that night, dreamt about it, thought about it got up the next morning and said, I'm going to grind these between two stones. When she did that, she discovered she had flour and the genius of that woman uh, allowed her to combine the flour with water and apply it to heat to it and she made bread. And I read about that in the Melbourne Age three years ago and um, I thought, you know, being a complete idiot, I thought, gee, that's interesting. I thought, I wonder who else made bread before that. So, uh, being a modern man, I googled it, uh, and Wikipedia acknowledged the Egyptians as being the first people on earth to make bread 17,000 years ago. 15,000 years after one of our women one of your women, your Australians, it's a triumph, a triumph of intelligence, ingenuity, science, agriculture, all of those things. And it's probably older than 32,000 years because in 220 years, 
How many grinding stones have been analysed with that purpose in mind? One. So the chances of actually finding the oldest grinding stone in Australia at the first try is, you know, like backing Richmond to win the grand final. You know, it's long odds, especially after last Saturday night. So the, the professors that told me that I couldn't mention agriculture and Aborigine in the same sentence had set me a, a challenge. And as I turned the pages of these history books, I'll, I'll tell you, I had tears in my eyes because I was, I was finding tools, Aboriginal tools, to fight this argument. There's nothing wrong with being a hunter and gatherer. And a lot of the things of food collection in this country are similar to hunting and gathering. But the truth is, we were not hunters and gatherers, mere hunters and gatherers. So I, I was thrilled to find these references, thrilled to be able to uh, debunk this idea of Australian Aboriginal people being hapless wanderers. Unfortunately, I believe that that insistence on our country in perpetrating this lie is to justify the possession of the land. If you can argue back to your own people in England, back to your own government in Australia, that Aboriginal people aren't doing anything with the land. They're not sophisticated enough to use it. They don't deserve it. And nothing, nothing is further from the truth. Well, it's lovely to be here. I, um, there were a lot of people here who were also at the museum and looking at those marvellous stones that the um, museum has in the cases there. Um, I'll be talking about those tonight. Uh, there were some very interesting stones in that collection. I was expecting um, a lot of small people, but there's a lot of big children here. Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about animals because the uh, both my young adult novels, the most recent ones, are, are about animals and fish and um, the country. He recoiled in shock on seeing a fox looking up at him. Automatically, he reached for the gun behind the door but then the light from the kerosene lamp shone richly on the garnet in the fox's collar. It wasn't a fox at all, it was a dox. It's a mighty task for you young people here. You're all young people, you're all younger than me, so um, you can all get into under that label, but for you people at school, you young people at school, you challenge your teachers. They teach you some rubbish about Australian history and you say, hang on, I don't think that's right. We're teaching our young people. I'm, I'm living on Ewan land, that's my, part of my family's land at the moment down on the south coast of New South Wales. And we've got a food company called Gurunji Munji. I'd be surprised if some people here uh, didn't uh, help us in the possible campaign last Christmas to raise, raise money. And we've employed um, a young woman uh, to work on uh, growing yam daisy for us. And she's doing a fabulous job. Um, and this has allowed us to put some intensive work into uh, bringing back 
these plants, which were domesticated plants of Aboriginal people. You know, one of the miracles of this kind of cooperation will be when we walk beside the Murray River and look down and there's water in it. What a radical idea. Fancy putting water in a river. You know, we flog that poor old stream. We flog all our streams. And we do so and we think it's justified by farming. It's great to be able to water grapes. It's fantastic. But surely there's a percentage has to be left in the river so that the Murrumbidgee doesn't turn blue. And kids who swim in it go to hospital. You know, this is not, this is not Plato. You know, you don't have to be Plato to work this one out. You don't have to be terribly smart to come up with the idea that rivers should have water in them. And yet we, we crush this poor old country. I drove through Melton yesterday or the day before and I saw how half-baked racehorses and sheep and goats were flogging the guts out of that country. You know, we, ha we owe it to the land to be a bit more gentle. And Aboriginal people had the tools for that. We've still got them and they can still be applied. Just a quick rundown on Dalesford Community Food Garden. It's open access 24-7. Uh, it's a non-membership thing. Um, we've got about five or six gardens at various different stages um, of operation that are dotted around the, the town. And the idea is that um, your community garden is in walking distance to your home. We started this uh, as a gorilla garden. Uh, we didn't ask permission. We started the first two gardens as gorilla gardens and council uh, kind of saw the momentum and the, the kind of spirit behind the work and they got behind us and uh, didn't throw us out. I thought it might be fitting that Bruce plant the first seeds in the garden here. With the permission of the um, uh, Jaja Ram, uh, when uh, we're involved in uh, cultural practice and planting seeds is cultural practice for us, uh, we would uh, you know, point to the, uh, the poles, Molina, Warragadan, Nacha, and when um, Aboriginal males speak to each other, they begin by saying Bingyaja Nala. Birgan, Nujan Jungle, which is through the mother. This is the mother. Merigan. Now we've got to wait here until they grow. <laughs> It's a, a great honour to uh, share this, uh, this event with, with Bruce. I suppose the ideas of Aboriginal active management, farming, use of the land, is something that has been with me most of my adult life. 
It actually dates from the first discussions with Bill Mollison in 1974 that led to the permaculture concept. Back then, we were discussing the implications of Rhys Jones's term fire stick farming and a lot of the historical evidence for Aboriginal management, manipulation, yes, even gardening and agriculture. But when I read Bruce's book, it was still a bit of a shock in terms of the scale of the evidence and the depth of manipulation of the, the biological materials, not just the manipulation of the landscape that so many of us have been uh, articulating, rediscovering what was known from the beginning. Of course, it was the legal fact under the British system, under our common law, that those who worked the land in the absence of legal title did have some rights under our law. So the denial that people were working the land was a very deliberate and necessary process for legal dispossession under our law. All the early explorers spoke in a matter of fact way about the management of land. I can remember as a child learning the history of Western Australia where I grew up that the settlers were stuck on the coastal plain because they couldn't get over the Darling Scarp. Now, anyone who's been to Perth and seen those low-rising hills that wouldn't amount to much more than walking from here to Kawinji, um, could have thought, as I did as a primary school kid, what sort of bloody wimps were they? <laughs> In fact, the explorer Dale who eventually did go up over the Scarp and through the Jarra Forest. That happened to be some of the densest forests in Australia, eucalypt forests that qualify as closed canopy, more like rainforest. After two days, his Aboriginal guide um, fled. It wasn't very familiar territory. On the coastal plain where I grew up, the wetland systems uh, were enormously productive. On the Swan River, Melville Water, where I swam as a child, a vast stretch of thousands of hectares of water. When William Flaming came up the river in a whale boat, they leaned out of the boat and grabbed a black swan. He described the water as covered with black swans. In my childhood, the last pair were breeding at Alfred Cove, where the council was filling in the swamps with the rubbish tips. So that cultural landscape where I grew up was the early place of occupation. And then when I came to live in this area, learning actually, again, that some of the local history from the same man who was visiting Captain Hepburn over on the footslopes of Mount Karushiang, that it was dangerous to ride horses through the yam uh, fields around the footslopes of the mount because they were so dug over that the horses could um, uh, lose their footing. It's interesting that Hepburn settled on what was probably the most fertile bit of central Victoria, on the, on the footslopes of the youngest volcanic soils in, in the district. But what happened to the yam daisies that were there 
they probably all disappeared with the sheep. And we just ended up with the ones in the bush on the most infertile soil. So in the same way that it's possible to have chooks revert to the Southeast Asian jungle fowl in about four generations, if they can go wild in the absence of things like foxes, and lose thousands of years of selection back to the original wild form, it's inevitable that any Aboriginal agriculture that was happening, that selection would disappear because those selected forms are not necessarily in complete ecological equilibrium. For a start, every other animal thinks those plants will be better to eat. So they eat out those ones first. And that's not allowing for what happened to the soils. Because all through our region, we only have the skeleton of the soils through all the bushland. Because all the A1 horizon disappeared in the gold era. On those youngest of volcanic soils, it's possible to rebuild a lot of that fertility from plants mining the minerals down deep. On our sedimentary soils, what was in the top one or two inches was everything nature under Aboriginal husbandry had managed to filter was all in that top few inches. And when that's gone, what you've got left is the skeleton of an ecosystem that people call the bush. Gum trees will just grow on the bones of the country. They don't need that fertility. But all the plants that are missing, all the soft herbaceous legumes and uh, plants like the yam daisies, all of that ground cover that was there has gone. And certainly with the current populations of kangaroos, rabbits, sheep, everything else that just constantly eats, a lot of those plants won't come back, even if there were seed sources there, because they are the very things that all those animals need to eat. So the landscapes we have are nothing like they were. That being said, I think that the redevelopment of some of the indigenous food plants as a serious part of garden agriculture to sustain people is a long-term project. It's the same long-term project as many of the other plants that show a lot of potential, but we've got to rediscover the strains and, and do that selection. And so those are tasks that I think are important, but they won't be done by the average gardener wanting to um, grow some tucker for their family this year. But I think they are part of a, um, a great purpose that we need to add. I suppose uh, something that I've felt very um, excited about over many years and then in some ways quite saddened that the, the vision of how we would select trees that produce great seeds for human food crops, that that project is still a very, very slow project. It's even slower for trees. And there's an essay on our website uh, dedicated to the memory of Peter Brew who gave us two bunya pines from Queensland to plant. Because bunya pine is Australia's greatest contribution to the, the tree crops of the world. Not just a nut, 
but a gigantic starch nut, four times the size of an almond, but in, in nutrition sense, a staple like chestnut. And like chestnuts, we eat a lot of roast bunyas when we can get them. Um, and our bunya pines, I say our bunya pines, they're not really our bunya pines. They're planted on the, on the public land, on the common, in what we call the Hepburn uh, Spring Creek Community Forest. It doesn't have any legal status. And the work we do on the common doesn't either. Those trees are starting to produce cones after 25 years. So I suppose a question might arise as, um, is that appropriate here? They came from Queensland. Um, uh, am I appropriate here with my Jewish ancestry, Irish ancestry, Swedish ancestry? Um, is it cultural appropriation for me to be planting those plants? Or if I plant yam daisy in the garden? Around the world, this issue with permaculture and cultural appropriation is a little bit of a hot topic because everywhere in the world, permaculture acknowledges indigenous and traditional people as the big source for what we need to do in the future. But not in the way that we need to exactly copy it in exactly the same place. Because the world has changed. Those soils are different. There's now seven billion people on the planet. We are post-fossil fuel rather than pre-fossil fuel. And all the cultures of the planet have been scrambled to some degree, to a great degree. We are dealing with a thousand broken jigsaw puzzles of which we need to take pieces that we think might be useful and hit over the horizon to a future we don't know where we have to again become indigenous. We're still discovering how many of those pieces for the new culture that will be woven in this place might actually be things that came from here. They will certainly include things that came from Western Europe, like the apple tree that is naturalising in our region on a large scale. Of course, it doesn't come from Western Europe. The Romans took it there. It comes from Kazakhstan. The apple tree is becoming indigenous. So in the same way, we all need to one day become indigenous and help with the process, Bruce, of rediscovering what's been lost. 